Shug had a had an apartment full of producers, and they, I guess they wasn't Producer. coming up with the right songs. Yeah. And he gathered them all up and said, "Look, either y'all start producing some hits." In the world of hip hop, the name Suge Knight invokes a sense of intimidation, fear, and dominance. The big bad wolf known as Suge had the reputation as someone you simply don't want to mess with. During the golden age of hip hop, Suge Knight reigned supreme, commanding both the streets and the studios simultaneously. As the man behind the iconic label that boasted stars like Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, and Tupac Shakur, his influence and power were unparalleled. Yet amidst this aura of authority, there emerged a young rapper who refused to be cowed by Suge Knight's reputation. A man who defied the odds and survived to tell the tale, 50 Cent. Now that the infamous Suge Knight is behind bars, 50 Cent had something to say about it, and we're here to tell you all about it. Suge Knight's life was already packed with events when he crossed paths with 50 Cent. Born as Mary and Hugh Knight Jr. in Compton, he was nicknamed Sugar Bear as a child, which later inspired his performer name. Knight showed promise in football, but didn't pursue a professional career. Instead, his massive frame led him to become a concert promoter and eventually a celebrity security guard, boasting a client list that included Bobby Brown. It's important to note that Suge built his career on a reputation of bullying and dominating artists, producers, and even founders of other labels. One of the first artists to experience Knight's wrath was Vanilla Ice, also known as Robert Van Winkle. In 1990, Vanilla dropped the huge success Ice Ice Baby, I'm sure you heard it, but Knight's agency owned the rights to the song, as it was written by Mario Johnson, a sign of Knight's agency at the time. Rumors circulated that Knight had threatened Vanilla Ice during negotiations and even hung him off a balcony, but these rumors were debunked by Vanilla Ice himself in a documentary called Welcome to Death Row. Ice clarified that Knight did not dangle him off the balcony and that they had no bad feelings toward each other. It's astounding how some people were willing to accept such rumors as truth solely based on the intimidating reputation that Knight had built for himself in just a few years. Suge Knight has to be one of the greatest villains of all time. Darth Vader, Joker, etc., etc. Suge is up there. Some praised Vanilla for doing the smart thing and avoiding more severe consequences. Vanilla Ice was wise enough to stay away from trouble with Suge Knight. Good thing that until now, he's safe, alive, and living peacefully. There's nothing wrong with admitting you're scared than to mess with these gangs and take away your life. Next year, Death Row gonna start printing our own money. Next year, Death Row gonna start printing our own money. In the 1990s, the West Coast hip-hop scene was dominated by Suge Knight. His intimidating persona, along with the immense talent at his disposal, made him a force to be reckoned with. Through his connections with DOC, Knight gained access to some of the most skilled members at NWA. This connection played a significant role in the formation of Death Row Records. A pivotal moment came when Dr. Dre and the DOC wanted to part ways with NWA and its record label, Ruthless Records, run by Eazy-E. tried to destroy my record company. Dre had been responsible for numerous successful projects, but he felt undervalued and decided to explore new possibilities. Vanilla Ice's departure from NWA opened the door for Dre's exit. With the back end of the DOC, Knight and Dr. Dre came together to establish their own record, Death Row Records. The rise of Death Row Records was meteoric, driven by the success of Dr. Dre's iconic album, The Chronic, and Snoop Dogg's debut album, Doggy Style. These albums propelled both artists to startup and solidified the West Coast's position in the hip-hop industry. However, Death Row's success was not without its controversies and conflicts. The label found itself under scrutiny due to the representation of the gangster lifestyle in their music. Suge Knight's rivalry with P. Diddy from the East Coast escalated and his association with Tupac Shakur further fueled the East Coast-West Coast War. Tupac joined Death Row Records after Knight posted his bail from prison. Despite the label's success, internal issues and Knight's confrontational nature led to some members, including Dr. Dre himself, distancing themselves from the label. Ultimately, Dre broke away from Death Row and formed his own label, Aftermath Entertainment. The departure of Dre and the escalating conflicts within the hip-hop community marked the beginning of a new chapter in the music industry. In 1996, the tragic death of Tupac Shakur in Las Vegas triggered immediate speculation about Suge Knight's potential involvement in the murder. Tupac himself had previously accused Suge of being connected to a plot to kill him. Some believed that the shooting might have been a part of the ongoing feud between East Coast and West Coast rappers. The following year, another devastating loss struck the hip-hop community when Notorious B.I.G. was fatally shot in L.A. Once again, rumors circulated about Suge Knight's potential role in this murder, too. Not only 
only had Biggie and Tupac been embroiled in a long-standing feud, but Suge had reportedly issued threats against Notorious B.I.G. in the past. While Suge Knight has constantly denied any involvement in those murders, doubts and skepticism persist among many people out there. His history of violence and intimidation has contributed to the suspicion surrounding his connections to the death of both Tupac and Biggie. Moreover, his close relationship with the two rappers has further fueled speculation about his potential involvement. In addition to the murder allegations, rumors have also emerged regarding the treatment of Tupac while he was under Death Row records. Some claim that Tupac signed with Death Row because Suge Knight posted his $3 million bail, but he allegedly became dissatisfied with the way he was treated by Suge and the label. Suge Knight's past and the cloud of suspicion surrounding his alleged involvement in the deaths of Tupac and Biggie have rendered him one of the most controversial figures in hip-hop history. While Knight vehemently denies any wrongdoing, his reputation for violence and intimidation has left many unconvinced, and the rumors of mistreatment towards Tupac have only added to the notorious reputation. However, Suge had plenty more controversies tied to his neck. The rise of Aftermath record would end up ultimately changing Suge Knight into success would soon run dry. The rise of Aftermath Entertainment marked a significant shift in the hip-hop industry. Dr. Dre, after facing some troubles with Ruthless Records and Death Row, founded Aftermath as a boutique label, valuing quality over quantity. Their debut album, Dr. Dre Presents the Aftermath, released in 1996, certified platinum by the RIAA, did not actually receive widespread popularity. However, the label's fortunes took a big old turn when Jimmy Iovine, co-founder of Interscope, suggested Dr. Dre sign an up-and-coming talent, Marshall Mathers, better known as Eminem. Give me all right, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. All right. Met a retarded kid named Greg with a wooden leg. Snatched it off and beat him over the head with the peg. Go to bed with the keg. Wake up with the 40. Mix it with alpha cells to reform me the 44D. Forget an acid tab. I strapped the whole seat to my forehead. Waited till it absorbed in and fell to the floor dead. Dre saw immense potential in Eminem and signed him to Aftermath. Eminem's debut album, The Slim Shady LP, caused immense controversy but became a massive success, propelling Eminem to startup, solidifying Aftermath's position in the industry. Another huge and pivotal addition to Aftermath was 50 Cent. Dre recognized his talents and signed him to the label in 2002. 50 Cent's debut album, Get Rich or Die Trying, released in 2003, was a sensational hit to say the least, selling nearly 900,000 copies in its first week and going nine times platinum as Aftermath's reputation grew, its early failures were overshadowed by its major successes. During this time, 50 Cent and Suge Knight, co-founder of Death Row Records, crossed paths. Suge's intimidating presence did not phase 50 Cent one bit, who had already experienced a turbulent life, including surviving being shot nine times. 50 Cent's resilience and success made it very clear that he couldn't be intimidated by anyone, including Suge. He came and was like, Suge's outside! Suge's outside! Everybody like, Shug, Shug, Shug. He was running, dropping shit. Pew! Light man, everybody going, Pow. I'm in front of the camera like this. <laughs> With Eminem and 50 Cent as the driving forces, Aftermath Entertainment thrived, while Suge Knight and Death Row Records faced numerous struggles. 50 Cent's arrival at Aftermath changed the dynamics, and the label's crew became cautious, traveling with bulletproof vests and cars due to the dangerous times that they were living in. Despite the rivalry and tension between Aftermath and Death Row, 50 Cent remained confident and proved that he was a force to be reckoned with, overcoming personal and professional challenges. In the world of hip-hop, where intimidation was often used as a tool, 50 Cent's resilience and success set him apart and made him an unstoppable force in the industry. As rumors swirled, it became evident that Suge Knight's encounters with 50 Cent were not limited to just one instance. On one occasion, Suge arrived with armed men while 50 Cent was alone, attempting to intimidate him. 50 Cent sees them, starts laughing, and starts running full speed. But 50 Cent stood his ground, responding with an Uzi to protect himself, causing Suge to back down once more. These interactions were indicative of a larger issue so to speak. Suge Knight's once formidable reputation and credibility were rapidly diminishing. In 2003, Suge found himself behind bars once again, maintaining a little bit of control of the label from inside the prison. However, his focus shifted towards launching smear campaigns against rappers he was feuding with, particularly targeting Snoop Dogg. Struggling to release any new albums during this time, Death Row faced financial troubles as well, compounded by Suge's unpredictable behavior. After the passing of Tupac, Death Row failed to discover or nurture new talent relying instead on posthumous releases of Tupac's music. By 2006, Suge and Death Row filed for bankruptcy, and the label's lack of major releases and big-name artists led to a significant decline in reputation. He runs over the two men. The truck backs up, hits one man. Seconds later, uh, the truck comes back and runs over that man. We've had to, you know, digitize the video because it's very violent. 
And then Suge's life took a very dark turn in 2015 when he was involved in a fatal car crash, resulting in a 28-year prison sentence. Suge's chances of ever getting out of prison are very slim. In contrast, Vidi Sin experienced both successes and challenges, bouncing back from bankruptcy and remaining a household name to this day. Though he didn't reach the heights of his debut album, he continues to thrive and even performed at the Super Bowl halftime show. Suge Knight's thuggish and bullying ways might have made connections and consolidated power in the past, but his violent tactics ultimately cost him respect and support from peers. Fiddy Sin, on the other hand, proved to be different. He wasn't just any man Suge can intimidate. He was the one who refused to back down. These brief encounters marked the beginning of the end for Suge, who had played with fire for far too long. In contrast, Fiddy Sin's unwavering demeanor ensured his name would be remembered far more favorably than Suge Knight's. Ultimately, Suge Knight was scared of 50 Cent, a man who stood his ground against intimidation, leading to Suge's downfall.